Bulletproof Radio, a state of high performance. You're listening to Bulletproof Radio with Dave Asprey. Today's cool fact of the day is that Google Glass, those funky augmented reality glasses, is showing promise as a tool to help kids with autism better navigate social situations. And as someone who uh, has, or at least had, the symptoms of Asperger's syndrome uh, as a kid, they didn't really have a formal diagnosis when I was a kid, uh, I definitely would have appreciated some technology guidance for social situations. And there's a new smartphone app that pairs your Google Glass headset with facial recognition software so the wearer gets real-time updates on what emotions people are expressing. Because believe it or not, when you're on the spectrum like that, you have no idea what the person across from you is feeling, but you would know if something told you that face equals this emotion, which would be really cool uh, for a lot of people. Uh, most kids just naturally learn to do this without thinking by playing. And kids with autism don't really get it and they have to learn. Uh, in my case, I spent a lot of time in my early 20s going to business networking meetings and making an ass of myself until I figured out how to play the game right. And I've hacked my brain uh, at the biological level and with a lot of neurofeedback. So I actually can read emotions a lot better than I ever did. But man, I wish I would have had some technology to do that, which is just really cool. In a pilot trial, 14 kids use the program for just over 10 weeks, and after the treatment, they had improved social skills, increased eye contact, and the ability to decode facial expressions. That is a really cool use of technology that's never been done before. Now, today's interview is going to be pretty cool because it's with a guy who definitely had a reason to read some social situations and emotions in a life or death situation. Uh, we're going to be talking with a guy who's a, a dual writer, a literary journalist, and a novelist who covered, in 2011, 10 Somali pirates in Germany for Spiegel Online, uh, part of The Mirror, which is a German weekly news magazine. And after the trial, he went to Somalia in 2012 to research a book about piracy and how to end it, and got kidnapped and held hostage for 32 months. He was freed in September 2014, uh, largely by his mother's <laughs> efforts uh, to gain his release, and wrote a memoir about it that came out in July. It's called The Desert and the Sea, 977 Days Captive on the Somali Pirate Coast. We are talking about none other than Michael Scott Moore. Michael, welcome to the show. Hi, Dave. Now, I think you, pre you prefer Mike normally, but you go by Michael as an author. Oh, it doesn't matter. You don't matter. All right. Honestly. Now, you've gone through this incredible experience. You were 45 when you were kidnapped. And your idea was to just go in and learn. And then basically some people grabbed you. What mm -hmm. happened? You know, 45 when I was released. Actually. Oh, when you are released. So okay. I, was, <laughs> I spent a good chunk of my mid-40s in Somalia. Uh, no, I went there partly because of the trial that I was following in Hamburg of the 10 pirates. And at least five of them were from central Somalia. Um, we first, I went with a partner, another journalist, and we first went to a town called Gal Galkayo, um, which is not even near the coast. And uh, five of the defendants were from Galkayo. So we thought that we'd get I thought I would get some background on that story um, and also a lot of information about how pirate ransom had affected um, the Somali economy because Galkayo was one of the places where there was obviously some money sloshing around. And um, I also thought that I would get some good information on a, on a book about Somali piracy, um, hitting some points that I, th I thought no one else was, was quite reaching. Um, so that's, that's why we went. That's why, um, I, I set off in, in January in 2012. You decided to do it. Uh, tell me about when you got grabbed. Uh, so I was with another journalist named Ashwin Rahman, who was a documentary maker for German television. And he, um, well, after we, we spent about 10 days in Somalia, um, he decided to go to Mogadishu, which meant we went to the airport. We decided to do everything together and stick together with our guards, our security and that kind of thing. So he got on the, the plane safely and we saw him off and it was on the way back from the airport towards Galkayo, um, downtown Galkayo, that we um, actually met a truck waiting for our, our car, actually a technical, which is a, a battle wagon, a wow. flatbed truck um, with a cannon in the back, a sort of anti-aircraft cannon. These are very typical vehicles in the Somali Civil War, but one was waiting by the side of the road. And it stopped our car and aimed that cannon through the windshield. Um, and my security 
basically gave up, felt overpowered, never, never fired a shot. And about a dozen guys with Kalashnikovs on the back of that technical came around to my side of the car and pulled me out. Uh, so they just grabbed you out of the way. Did they tell you why they were doing it? Was this reprisal? What, what, was, the, what was the motivation there? Was it just yeah. a ransom? There, there was, there was no explanation, nothing like that. I mean, I tried to hold the the door closed, right? So they they ripped it open and beat my my wrist until it was broken and pulled me out and beat beat my head. I mean, it was extremely violent. Um, and then we spent about three or four hours in a in another SUV. They bundled me into a car and we spent three or four hours driving into the bush, which means, um, yeah, no one told me a thing. Um, there was no explanation at all. I think in fact that technical was waiting for both of us. They probably wanted us to take that particular road out to the airport and they were probably disappointed not to have two foreign journalists, um, captive. So Ashwin feels actually uh, lucky that he didn't get captured with me. Um, but, uh, within a week I made a phone call home and by then the pirates had said, Oh, we think you're a spy. So that was the justification they gave me. Um, but, the, you know, you hear that a lot, actually, um, among kidnap stories with that involve journalists. Did you go through training ahead of time about what to do if you're kidnapped? Uh, no, I didn't have any training in, in that sort of thing. Uh, do you wish you had? Um, only for, I mean, yes and no. Um, there, there was a training through the German, um, journalists union that I, I could have taken. And I thought about it. It was just that the timing was wrong. Um, the one thing I really needed training for, and that I would like to give training to other people about is, um, mounting a hunger strike. And I'm not sure that was in, involved in the training. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure I would have learned a few things, you know, up front that I, that I spent time learning while I was there. But the most important thing to me um, was being able to navigate a hunger strike. And that, that took some, some experience. Um, I did an urban escape and evasion, uh, training for several days. Not that I have a great fear of being kidnapped or anything like that. I just thought it'd mm -hmm. be kind of cool to know how to pick handcuffs and know if you're being tailed and all that mm -hmm. kind of stuff. Uh, it was actually a really eye opening experience for me just to understand you know, the, the stress where the, the final exam was being hooded and handcuffed yeah. and escaping and you know, being followed through a city by people trying to catch you. Yeah. Um, it was actually, frankly, terrifying um, at a level that was still <laughs> just training. Mm -hmm. And yeah, sure. uh, you went through that at a, at a whole nother level. Uh, but you're sitting here talking about it uh, relatively uh, calmly. You're, you're not uh, you're not in, in tears or, or showing signs of uh, physical stress from this. What mm -hmm. did what did you do? I mean, that you you, you had you know, hits to the head, you know, broken wrist, uh, months and months, or frankly, years mm -hmm. of captivity. But you seem reasonably well put together. What, what did you do to get over this? Well, it's been a few years now. I mean, the the main thing is that I wrote the book. I wouldn't have been able to talk about it like this before I wrote the book. Um, uh, so the book. First of all, it had the the effect of talk therapy. It, it, I, it allowed me to put all the events into some sort of narrative. Um, but it also just made me fluent with the material in a way that I wasn't in, when I got out in 2014. So it's been a few years, you know, so that, that helps. Um, it probably took me a year to recover physically. But um, mentally, I... I'm probably okay, but I, I, I take it one day at a time. I don't, I don't take anything for granted. I interviewed Laura Logan, uh, the uh, 60 Minutes correspondent who had a real traumatic experience uh, in Egypt. Uh -huh. uh, and we, we had a similar discussion. And, and the reason I'm asking this is that uh, there are a lot of people listening who, who go through traumatic experiences, uh, most mm -hmm. of them nowhere near as, as intense and enduring as yours. Mm -hmm. uh, and people bear scars in, in different ways, and people recover in different ways. And I'm I'm really curious. So you spent a year physically recovering. Did you you know get uh, therapy? Did you go to you know, post hostage counseling, or was this sort of a solo thing or a family thing? Like like, what's your approach to just putting your putting your 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 head back together again after that? Well, the um, <clears throat> the FBI had a, a psychologist by my side as soon as I got off the plane. 
Uh, in, in fact, before I got off the plane, I didn't realize he was a psychologist until <laughs> we landed in Nairobi. But um, he wound up on the C-130 that the F Air Force used to fly me out of um, Somalia. <clears throat> uh, he uh, he was really good. And he had experience, I think, in the Special Forces and also dealing with soldiers who who had PTSD. And at some point, I realized that he was probably there to diagnose me. <laughs> And I turned to him. I mean, even even in those first few days before I flew back to Europe, while we were still in Nairobi, I said, are you here because I might have PTSD? And he said, we don't like to put a label on anything. And I mean, in those in those first few days, I definitely had symptoms. Um, I, I was I had written about PTSD before, so I knew what they were. And I was easily, um, high, you know, high, hyper um, hyper vigilant. You know, I got nervous when there were too many. When we went out in public in Nairobi, and there were too many people around, too many strangers, too much input to take to keep track of. But in those first few weeks, while I was still debriefing with the FBI, <clears throat> the psychologist flew back with me to Berlin, along with a couple of agents, um, both from the U.S. and from Germany. Um, I gave the first version of the story. First of all, I mean, I told it from start to finish for the first time. Um, and he was there every day <clears throat> and he was, what can I say? He was excellent. Um, he, he told me things before I knew I was going through them, which I found a little bit annoying at first. <laughs> um, but he saw everything coming and, and read me really well. And after a few months when I saw him again, I think f for lunch at some point I said, um, you know, I'm not in regular therapy and should I be worried about that? Should I be in talk therapy? By this time, I'd started my book. And he said, you know, we don't need to pathologize anything. Yeah. In other words, you don't have to create a, a condition in your mind that you then also have to recover from. You have enough to recover from on your own. And in fact, in my case anyway, the body and mind know how to do that if you just leave them alone. Um, not leave them alone. I, 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 I exercised. <laughs> you know, right. I went to the gym. I was, I was incredibly thin and weak when I first got out. <clears throat> and I knew I needed a lot, but... After seeing a few doctors, I knew physically what I needed. And as I started to recover physically, I, I, the, the mental stuff also took care, of the, took care of itself. Slowly, slowly. Um, I interviewed a guy, uh, a physician named Mark Gordon, who believes that people don't get long-lasting uh, PTSD unless they have a traumatic brain injury. But you mm -hmm. took some substantial hits to the head. Did you get diagnosed with a brain injury or is your, no, your brain I don't, okay? No, I'm I'm pretty sure I didn't have a brain injury. Uh, I I probably one another aspect of PTSD supposedly is that you get flooded with stress hormones and it can affect your um a, a couple of glands in there. Uh, I was certainly <laughs> um, flooded with cortisol more than once. You know, um, uh, I mean I definitely felt that. But w was I permanently changed? I'm not I'm not so sure. Um, I I've, I've read a couple of books in the meantime, including the 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 one book, The Body Keeps the Score. Uh -huh. um, by um, Mr. Va Dr. Van der Kolk, um, a Dutch American, I think, and um, it's quite good. Y y obviously, these things leave leave traces, but um, I have to say that yoga um, helped quite a bit, both while I was there and and also afterwards. So you did yoga uh, when you were with your captors. Yeah. What did they think about that? <laughs> I thought it was hilarious. <laughs> uh, I, when I got, so I was held in several places, right? When I fir first was captured, I was held in the bush in, for about three months with one other hostage that they put me together with. Then they put us on a ship um, where we had about 30 other hostages to be friends with. Um, all that was very social. After the ship, they held me alone on land. And once it became clear to me that I was going to be on land for, well, even before I realized how long I was going to be there, um, I asked for a mat um, to do yoga and to do exercise because um, the prison houses were very barren and sort of concrete and dirty. And so I asked for a mat and I looked for a moment where the guards weren't watching me because I knew they would think yoga was ridiculous. <laughs> um, but they were watching me 24 hours a day. So I... One day I just started to do it, and and you know all these all these heads came in around the doorway, you know, and they started to laugh and snicker, and uh, then a couple of them came in and sort of imitated me, and I, I figured they were joking, but after a couple of days they kept doing it. They brought in um, broken down 
cardboard boxes for mats because, like I said, the, f- the floor was filthy. So they had these cardboard flats that they used as their yoga mats, and they imitated my postures. And th- the ones who kept doing it, I realized they were afraid of me getting in shape while they didn't, while they sort of wow. – they, they were also locked in the compound, and so they were aware of becoming sort of weak too physically. Um, so they, they were trying to do the exercise with me and eventually I gave them tips. I, you know, I corrected their postures. <laughs> <laughs> the, the whole thing didn't last very, more than a few weeks, but, um, I continued to do, to you, to do yoga and, and they sort of fell off. <laughs> did, did you ever uh, you know, form a connection to any, any of them, uh, sure. so, some more friendly and all what, tell me about that. Yeah, sure. No, there were, um, I would say when I was being held alone like that in solitary after the ship, uh, there was always a team of at least seven guys, up to 15 guys, so maybe an average of 10. And about half of them um, were willing to talk to me, were willing to sort of get along with me. Uh, They had a little bit of English and I had a little bit of Somali, and so we built up a pigeon to communicate with. And uh, yeah, sure, I, I got to know them as individuals. What was it like when when you got out? Walk me through what happened. Well, so when I when I got out, um, okay. When I say that I I became friendly with a few guards, it was still on this basis of being enemies. You know, you still had very simple conversations, and you knew that you couldn't trust a pirate guard very far. So I got out, and all of a sudden, I was in the hands of people who meant me well. You know, um, first the Bush pilot who flew me out, and then uh, some American Air Force people on the C-130, the transport plane that flew me finally to Nairobi, and then my family and friends once we flew back to Berlin. Um, and I didn't know how to deal with that. <laughs> I mean, obviously, I was glad to be free, but I didn't know how to deal with so many well-meaning people speaking my own language. <laughs> wow. um, and 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 that's the sen- in that sense, it was possibly a little bit like having Asperger's. I I think that I was easily overwhelmed by all the possible social cues and all the ways that we communicate that aren't verbal. Um, I had simply lost um, practice dealing with that. And it took me a while to feel strong enough to just have a com- have a uh, coming home party. It would have been too many people in the room at once, you know. So it took two or three weeks before I could do something like that. Um, the my, Of course, my mother was there, my, um, my immediate German family, and I saw some friends, obviously, in the first few days. But I tried to keep the group situations to a minimum because I was so easily overwhelmed. Tell me about hope. Uh, were you hopeful the whole time? Yeah, no, not at all. Um, especially after about a year had elapsed, I got really um, despondent. And by that point, the, I was in these prison houses and, and just dealing with a, a team of guards. And they would try to tell me, you know, you're going to go free in two weeks or you're going to go free in a month. Um, and I believed them at first. You know, I was stupid enough to get my hopes up. And I realized pretty quickly that that was um, not the way to go. You know, after a month, when you realize that this date has passed that they sort of promised to set you free on, um, you you got even more depressed and more despondent than before. Um, so in other words, hope and despair were a cycle, which I describe in The Desert and the Sea as a breaking wheel. I mean, it was really sort of a torturous cycle. And eventually I had to detach myself from it entirely. Um, which is a Buddhist idea. How did you go about detaching from hope? Um, I had to stop thinking about the future period. And uh, certainly after two years, I thought, well, there's a really good chance I'm not going to get out of here alive. Um, And uh, um, it's entirely probable I'm not going to see my family and friends again. So, you know, even if someone tries something drastic and uh, tries to rescue me militarily, there's only going to be a certain percentage chance that I would survive Um, and a pretty good percentage chance that the pirates are just going to let me die of neglect or or kill me by accident, which happens. They tend not to kill hostages on purpose over there. But um, I stopped living for the future. I mean, I stopped thinking and looking forward to the day when I was going to be free and and seeing my family and friends again because I 
didn't trust that that was even going to happen. Um, but I also had to make a conscious decision from day to day whether I was going to continue to live. And that puts you more or less in the moment. You know, that makes you deal with the present. Um, and that was a that was a tough discipline, but a very essential one. What made you decide to live? Uh, so there was there was a period where I wrestled with whether I was going to pick up a gun. They had guns lying around all the time, and either end my own life or try to blast my way out, um, which would have been suicide on its own because there were too many guards. Um, and you know, I was angry at them all the time. I was obviously emotional, even though I kept my mouth shut most of the time. Um, and I stopped wrestling with that quite so much when I made a conscious decision to forgive them. And the way I, the way that occurred to me was that I was listening to the, to the radio and I actually heard the new Pope. I wasn't sure what had happened to the old Pope, but there was a new Pope, Pope Francis, and he gave a very interesting homily about forgiveness. Um, that included a very simple image, which was the image of um, the stars and the sun. He said, you know, you at night we're very aware of all our shortcomings and all our failings and all our sins, which spoke to me as a hostage. I felt guilty for just getting myself into that position, right? And uh, he said, um, but in the morning the sun rises and banishes the stars. And he said, the mercy of God is like that. And the 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 idea behind that, of course, is to pass it on, is to apply it to other people who you might not be in the mood to forgive. And as soon as I did that, and it was a conscious decision, um, and and forgave my guards on a daily basis, I had to keep doing it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, my mind was better. My my mind was no longer um, full of victimhood. It was no longer full of anger. And it wasn't as despondent um, or desperate. Um, I still wasn't sure I was going to see my family and friends again, but I, I could see my way to surviving from day to day. Have you had a chance to thank the Pope for that homily? <laughs> no, I haven't, as a matter of fact. I, I'm not quite sure how to get in touch with him, but I, um, <laughs> no, it's, I, that's, that's a very good point. I, I missed a chance uh, to have a private audience with the Pope earlier this year uh, because yeah. it was my kid's birthday. And oh, right. <laughs> I'm not going to miss my kid's birthday. Uh, and uh, I, I suspect it would be uh, beneficial uh, for you to do that, uh, both for you and him, because sure. it's always good to know you did someone a solid that you didn't know you were doing, right? That's, that's a very good point. Maybe I should write to the Vatican. Uh, I, I think that would be powerful. <laughs> the, it, it's profound that you found forgiveness in, in the middle of you know, a hellish situation there. Mm -hmm. And I'm grateful that you uh, just shared that with everyone listening, because uh, forgiveness on a daily basis is, is definitely a practice uh, that I follow and something that I do mm -hmm. with electrodes hooked to my head to make sure I'm doing it all the way because mm -hmm. if you're carrying a lot of baggage towards your captors or towards you know, people who are mean to you or whatever, mm -hmm. it uh, um, it costs you a lot. And yeah. literally the first day you did it, you you felt a, a different sense, that, like your your brain turned on. Yeah. The, the the First of all, it was very overwhelming to hear that <clears throat> on the radio. Um, and the the conscious decision to to change my attitude and to to reorient my my mind it's a question of judgment so i mean i i was sitting there um judging the guards for doing something that was obviously evil um but i i go into this in the desert and the sea too uh epictetus who is a stoic philosopher points out that the only real freedom we have is to choose between good and bad and he talks about turning that judgment inward and once you do that, you quit worrying about whether you're, you know, your persecutors are good or bad and worry about your own mind, which is what you actually have control over. Um, then the world changes. And that's, that's exactly what happened. Uh, that's, uh, that is, is truly amazing. Do you, do you still forgive your captors on a daily basis? Uh, yes. That doesn't mean I don't want a couple of them to face justice, but um, <laughs> no, you, you can forgive someone and still want them to be in jail. <laughs> that's right. Uh, but it, it's a question of holding, holding that emotional grudge. Okay. And, and what does your forgiveness practice look like? Um, it, yeah, if I start to get frustrated, if I start to get angry and hit some sort of, you know, one of these roadblocks, uh, first of all, I think about everything that I went through and the fact that I'm 
out and alive. Um, and that brings me back to the, the gratitude I felt when I first got out. Um, and that helps loosen the, the rest of it. I mean, that, the, that gratitude helps, helps with forgiveness. In the, in the neuroscience uh, training program I, I do with executives and all, I simply don't believe, based on brain waves, that you can mm -hmm. for, forgive until you have the feeling of gratitude. So you, I think that's right. I think that that's that's exactly. You didn't have I mean, you did yoga, but you didn't have training in forgiveness and gratitude, or, uh, a practice based on that. Were you Catholic? You, you were talking about the Pope. Were you Catholic, or are you Catholic? Yeah, I was raised Catholic, so okay. I was a very pious Catholic boy. Um, I would say I'm I'm a lapsed Catholic still because. Um, I'm, I'm a little bit too promiscuous with my sources of wisdom. I think, um, <laughs> the, the Vatican would pro still probably not accept me as a fully, uh, um, onboard Catholic. Uh, well, you, uh, you definitely had, uh, had some, some powerful wisdom that came your way when you were doing that. Um, did you hallucinate? Uh, that's a good question. Probably not. Um, but, but it's, it's hard to say sometimes. I, I had I had very strange ideas while I was there, so um, it's it's not off the table. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I guess if you're hallucinating, you're not sure you're hallucinating. Yeah, that, that would be the definition of hallucination. All right, I got you It'd on that bad. one. <laughs> uh, tell me about hunger and hunger strikes. What happened there? Right. Well, uh, it took a while for me to mount one and and bother with a hunger strike uh, because I wasn't sure they would work. Um, and I'm, I'm not sure that I wasn't punished for them either, by the way. But, um, at one point the pirates put chains on my feet and, um, I was a little bit naughty. I got rid of, I got rid of the keys. Um, but they couldn't prove that I, I had thrown the keys down the toilet <laughs> so just, just to make sure they sort of left the chains on, on me in the morning <clears throat> when it was time for breakfast. And that was unusual. The chains had been on my feet at night for maybe a month or a few weeks at that point. Um, and I was so angry and so upset at missing, they didn't, they didn't, um, no, they did bring me a, bo a bowl of beans, but they hadn't removed the, the chains. And I said, no, I'm, I'm not eating. And it was incredible. They got very agitated right away. And for the first time in, this was just after a year. So the first time in maybe 14 months, I felt powerful. I felt like I had some influence over the men who were controlling my life. And um, they got really upset that I didn't want to eat breakfast. And um, they ordered some lunch from outside. They, they had the, the best food you could get as a hostage was camel meat. And they obviously ordered camel meat. So the whole prison house filled up with this, um, this smell. And then they invited me to join them and eat. And they had a great feast over there. And I said, nope, because my the chains were still not on. And uh, I had to decide exactly when I was going to quit. Once I'd declared the hunger strike, I realized I was in the situation and I had to decide what my own terms were, you know. Um, and I, I figured it was going to last a couple of days. Um, but they were so upset by this hunger strike that after inviting me to eat lunch maybe twice, they said, okay, what do you need? I said, take off the chains. And they said, okay, if, you take, if we take off the chains, you'll eat? I said, yeah. <laughs> it works. So um, that was the first time I'd had any kind of power like that over over the pirates, and um, I used it again a few times whenever they forgot to give me beans for breakfast. So in other words, if out of negligence they just didn't get, bring me um, breakfast in the morning, and keep in mind I was hungry all the time in Somalia, right. they never fed me enough, um, and somebody just let it slide to feed the hostage breakfast on, on a certain morning, I made sure that I turned it around. And in the language, the pigeon that we spoke, the word chum chum meant food or eat. So I told them, Michael, no chum chum, Michael, no chum chum, which means if Michael can't eat, Michael won't eat. So all of a sudden I was on a hunger strike because they weren't feeding me and they got all agitated again and they brought me food. And then I was okay. So I, that was how I made sure they fed me instead of just acting like you know, negligent jailers, which is what they were, which is what they were sometimes. But, um, at another point, uh, one of the guards actually injured me, um, twice actually. And, uh, in both cases I protested with hunger strikes. 
And those were, those were more difficult. Those those lasted a while, and those went up to the boss, and I knew the boss was was involved and upset at me, and um, that could have that could have been very bad. Um, one of them lasted almost a week. I cheated. I I I ate in the meantime and found ways to you know get food or go off the strike for a few hours or whatever. Um, but I wound up not getting anything except a show of some, some help from a doctor at some point. Wow. Yeah. What's your relationship with food like now? Uh, well, I, (laughs) it's much better. (laughs) Um, I, I, I'm a good cook. I, before, before I was in Somalia, I don't think I was a very creative cook, but while I was there, all I could think about for part of the day was what I wanted to eat. And at some point when I got my hands on a notebook, um, one of the first things I wrote down aside from some stories in my head, were um, um, recipes. And so I, I wrote down recipes I'd never even bothered to cook for myself, um, recipes I was thinking I might like. And in some cases, I got all the ingredients right, including for a kidney stew I'd had once in Britain. Um, I was surprised. It, it was a, uh, from a few years earlier, and, and it was just an intense craving for iron and protein. Um, and now I, I make the, that kidney stew for myself. But it was straight from that recipe that I wrote down in the notebook. Wow. <laughs> it was accurate. So. <laughs> Do you still eat beans? Sure. Well, yes, but not <laughs> that. These, these are very local beans in, in Somalia, sort of brown beans, and they, there was never any salt involved. And so oh. you know, it was just beans and sometimes beans with sugar if I wanted to put that down on in the morning. So I, yeah, I don't need to eat that. I don't need to eat that anymore. I don't need to eat boiled goat, at least with no seasoning. And I don't need to eat canned tuna ever in my life. (laughs) I can, I can respect that. Uh, (laughs) uh, Now, do you ever practice fasting, intermittent fasting? No. No, No. (laughs) you probably never want to. I I was guessing that was going to be your answer. I had to check. (laughs) Now, Talk about tolerance. Are you more tolerant of people and their you know, misbehaviors, you know, the, the things they do that you don't like, or are you less tolerant after this experience? Uh, that's a good question. I, I mean, I, I think I'm pretty good at seeing through people's bullshit, so I, d- I don't necessarily put up with that from strangers or whatever else, but I don't have a whole lot of people immediately around me who, um, who, who act in in weird ways. Um, but I'm also not, I also don't freak out. So in other words, I learn to handle it quietly, um, which is normally pretty good. Um, as far as tolerance of sort of strangers and immigrants, I mean, one, one thing that was clear while I was in Somalia was that some of my pirate guards wanted to move to Europe. They wanted to get on a boat from Libya and cross the Mediterranean. Um, and in the meantime, I've written about that pir- that um, um, that migrant trail, where it, it turns out some pirate bosses are actually financiers in East Africa. Um, and when I got back, you'd think, okay, well, Michael doesn't want any Muslims of any kind um, in in Europe, but but that's that's not quite true. Um, I I know too many Somalis to to feel that way, um, and. I think that process of forgiveness taught me um, something about good and evil that that makes it impossible for me to think of one group of people hmm. as good as good or evil. Um, that's just not how it works. So, if anything, um, that although I'm wary about you know Islam in the West and that kind of thing, um, I'm. Uh, I'm th- that process of forgiveness actually deepened my tolerance for strangers. Wow. If you had an opportunity to be face to face in a room with your captors in, in a, in a safe room, you know, in the West, would you take it? Um, maybe. Yeah. Maybe. What, uh, would, you, what would you say? <clears throat> well, one thing they did was, um, they always brought no matter what kind of, no matter uh, what we ran out of food wise for some reason they always had biscuits and mango juice so i might give them a bottle of mango juice um, um 
No, not as forgiveness, but just you know. <laughs> sort of like here, have some I'm more of this. <laughs> I'm assuming if I met him, he would be in jail. So, uh, yeah. You know. So he might want some because he's eating he prison might, chow. <laughs> he might need a bottle of mango juice. <laughs> that, that is a fantastic answer. <laughs> Did you laugh when you were a captor? Yes, only a few times, but uh, yeah, there were a few moments where I, I laughed out loud. Um, I mean, I think that's important to say that the that even a situation like that is not 100 percent um, awful, which is another way of saying you can't spend 24 hours a day angry. Um, and so that's what the one thing I tried to capture in the desert and the sea were the the vagaries, especially the emotional vagaries of a situation like that. Um, and one thing I've talked about before, but I've I didn't put it in the book simply because it didn't fit where it, where it belonged. Um, it would have been too much of a uh, diversion. Um, was a story I heard on the BBC um, around New Year's Eve in 2013 um, about a great big rubber ducky in a harbor in Taiwan that um, um, was being used for New Year's celebrations or something, um, except it got attacked by birds and exploded. <laughs> <laughs> and all I could imagine were, you know, eagles or something like that, They're very territorial about this enormous bird and the surprise they must have felt when they attacked it you know, um, and it just blew up in their faces. Um, so that, that, that made me laugh out loud while I was just sitting under my mosquito tent, listening to my shortwave radio. <laughs> uh, um, that's actually, that visual is making me laugh right now. <laughs> I, I have bald eagles circling uh, around outside my window right now and they're, they, they do get pretty pissed off sometimes. So I, yeah. I, I can see this. <laughs> <laughs> I think in real life, I've looked it up in the meantime, that it was, it probably exploded because of the weather. Yeah. Because if you look at pictures, there are no birds in the pictures. Um, so either they flew away really fast or the, the, the story, the way I heard it, was funnier in Somalia than it was in real life. <laughs> did, and that tells you how much is mental. Did they give you the shortwave radio just for entertainment purposes? It, it seems almost like a luxury item. Yeah, it was. Uh, so I had to keep asking for it over several months. Um, I, I think I had one early on, and then when they put us on the uh, fishing vessel uh, in April in 2012, um, they took it away. They confiscated it, and then I spent about a year and a half with no news at all, nothing from the outside world except the occasional phone call to my family. And uh, when I was back on land and in that series of prison houses, I, th I think I started to ask over and over for a shortwave, and finally the um, boss gave me a battered one, you know, an old one. Um, it was a piece of crap, but, um, it really helped. It, it was not just for, um, entertainment pur purposes. I mean, it was definitely a distraction, but it really helped to hear news from the outside world. Um, and it turned out that after almost a year of listening to it before I got out, I was pretty up on the news. <laughs> <laughs> the PC World Service, only half an hour, two, maybe two half hours a day, uh, kept me pretty well versed. So. so you felt at least connected to the outside world, even though you weren't in it. Exactly. A little bit connected. So not, not when I got back, um, there wasn't a complete Rip Van Winkle effect. Um, okay. I still have a, that year and a half in the middle where I had no news, and I'm still learning about things that went on then and people who died. Um, that'll probably go on for the rest of my life. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's like a big a big gap in the middle there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there was a time, though, when you decided you were going to escape. You'd, you'd been a captive for a while. You were going to jump off the ship. Uh, mm -hmm. Walk me through what was going on in your mind. How long, had, how long did it take to get there? Well, the ship uh, was a tuna vessel, and it was about 50 meters long, so an industrial tuna vessel, not a trawler, but a long liner. And as soon as they put me on board, I wanted to jump off it. I'm a surfer, so I, it, it didn't seem like um, a difficult thing. We were only anchored about a mile from shore, and it always seemed reasonable for me to, to swim to shore. Just you know, the question of, you know, how many times I would get shot. Right. <laughs> so I, I didn't do it, obviously, for, for very good reasons. Um, but a couple of times, uh, a Western helicopter came and visited the, um, the ship and circled around. And I thought, you know, maybe I should jump now. It's, in, in retrospect, it's probably good that I didn't. 
um, on those occasions because there, there were armed men in those helicopters and there was a tense standoff between the pirates who immediately grabbed their weapons and the sniper, um, if not more than one gunman on, on board the helicopter. So there would have been an exchange of gunfire probably if I'd broken that. Um, so th these were things going through my head until one day at the very end of the summer in 2012 when the anchor chain broke on that vessel, on the HOM-3. Um, and all of a sudden we were sort of freely um, drifting on this powerful current that was going northwards along the Somali coast. And the, the ship had actually started to turn, this enormous 50-meter vessel, you know, turning in the water. And I almost jumped in, um, but the crew got the ship under control and the pirates put me in a cabin. And once the ship was actually trundling I think to the south um, and heading for some new destination. I, all that was going through my mind was that the pirates were going to put us on shore again. And I, I'd spent enough time on shore beforehand, about three months, that I knew I didn't want to go back. Um, and I also knew that we were being watched. I mean, I knew that there was Western surveillance watching the ship, um, not just from the helicopters, but also drones I'd seen and a plane that came to sea the ship as soon as the anchor chain had broken. Uh, so the, I thought there might be some sort of rapid response if I, if I jumped. Uh, I was also fairly desperate. You know? So um, that night, while the ship was still moving um, from one point of the coast to another, I found an excuse involving toilet paper to get down to the lower deck. Um, and the Somali who, had, who took me out um, for this little errand um, didn't have a weapon. And I thought, okay, now's my, now's my chance. So I took a running leap for the side of the ship and I dove into the water. Um, <clears throat> and immediately, obviously, I was I was frightened because I thought I was going to get shot. No Somali fired his gun. Wow. Um, I got free of the ship and, and away from the ship fairly quickly because I read the current. I, was, I, I could tell which way the swell was going. But um, I was moving at an angle to the shore, um, and I didn't expect the ship to turn around because it was the, ship, this, the motor didn't sound too good, and I thought it was um, in uh, not very good condition to pull a maneuver like that. And so I thought I would either float there until you know some helicopter found me, or I would swim to shore. Uh, instead, the ship started to come back on that current that I had s swum out with, um, and started rolling back towards me on these swells. At night. <laughs> oh, no. And um, um, eventually the ship would have rolled over me with barnacles on the bottom and everything like that. So I, I had to give up. Um, if I had been convinced that, that somebody was already on its, you know, helicopter was on its way to get me or whatever, I would have evaded. Um, but they probably would have started, started shooting at that point. So. so what happened when you got pulled back in? What happened mentally? Uh, the The... The crew f threw a life preserver to me and pulled me up the side of the ship. And then um, the pirates were pissed off. <laughs> the pirates were pretty angry. Um, and a pirate, they put me in, in my cabin and I had to stay there. And a pirate boss the next morning came in and, and gave me a beating. Um, but they, they asked me why I had done it. And I had no alibi. I mean, I was ready to just be off the ship and drown myself if necessary. I thought that was just going to be the end one way or the other. Um, but they had threatened with, uh, threatened to sell me to Al-Shabaab a few months before. And so I said, I was afraid of going on land and getting sold, sold to Al-Shabaab. I figured if the pirates were going to make stupid threats like that to me, um, even a few months earlier, uh, they could damn well hear them again. Um, <laughs> so that, that turned out to be not a bad alibi, but, um, and in fact, what happened after that was the, the pirates, they kept me in this solitary confinement in the cabin on the ship for about three weeks and then put, brought me on shore. And all of a sudden I was in the hands of another half of the pirate gang. So a different, slightly different group within the same gang. And um, only then did negotiations start. So the, the, this was months into my captivity and the pirates had been hanging on to a demand of $20 million um, almost through September. Which um, which was insane to me. So I and and from phone calls on the ship, I knew I knew that negotiations were going nowhere. So this new group on land, they they began to negotiate very slowly, but but at least they started. 
now the, the us and and britain have a really strict no concession policy probably the strictest mm-hmm. in the world where they're just not going to pay uh, pirates mm-hmm. or hostage takers at all mm-hmm. um, so what what happened uh the, so my my mother had to raise money um with help of some from some magazines i'd worked for and a couple of other institutions um and uh she was the voice on the phone she was the person who who talked the pirates down from this absurd 20 million dollar figure to 1.6 million and in the end that that's what was paid so so someone brought 1.6 million bucks in cash to somalia and a couple of hours later i was driven out of the prison house and, and delivered to a to a bush pilot to a plane that had come to land in galkayo are you concerned that that will lead to more hostage taking uh, yes, I'm concerned that the the any of that money that flows to a criminal organization will be used for more criminality. Um, by that point, the the piracy off Somalia had fallen off. Um, I learned that on the on the radio while I was lying there, and I felt really stupid for having gone there to write a book about piracy and then have it end essentially while I was there. Uh, but it's not completely over. The gangs are still together and that money has probably been used for, um, if not hostage taking, then maybe drugs, uh, gun smuggling or drug smuggling, or whatever else the gangs get into, including people smuggling, by the way, towards, um, Libya. Um, <clears throat> but one thing I have to say is that two days after I got out, um, those two halves of the pirate gang got together to argue about the money and, um, there was a shootout. <laughs> so five top ranking pirates, including three bosses, um, three top bosses, uh, killed each other. So the money went, um, to a couple of people who survived, but, um, um did, and they certainly don't deserve it, but did you feel the sense of mirth that I just felt when you heard that the uh, yeah, well, at that point, I was, you know, I was this recovering hostage on my second day in Nairobi when I first heard about that. Um, and so it was disbelief, you know, my jaw just sort of dropped. Um, but yeah, I had spent a lot of time sitting there wondering what how I would feel if a SEAL team came blasting in and killed all these guards who were the low ranking pirates on the totem pole, and some of whom I'd gotten to know and, and like a little bit, you know, how would I feel if they were, you know, the best case scenario in the case, it, in a in a rescue would have been Mike gets rescued alive and all these guys that I just got to know are dead um, and that would have happened no matter what and then you're not even definite that the that that Mike will be alive um, the way it turned out was like five of the guys who richly deserved it killed each other um, that did strike me as a form of justice a little bit of karma they, they earned it <laughs> definitely they earned it and they inflicted it on themselves <laughs> You've talked about uh, real human freedom and and the thinking skills that change your approach towards any problem. Mm -hmm. What does it mean to you? Well, what I mentioned about Epictetus saying um, that the rearrangement of your mind so that you are not worried too much about what other people are doing and more about what you're doing and um, the way you're thinking unfolds um that's the main thing you have control over and that's true whether you're you know a a rich executive or or a prisoner somewhere um this is the most important and most immediate kind of human freedom um and it can it can change any problem almost immediately because it 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 changes your your mental orientation towards it for people listening to the show uh how would you suggest that they tap into that ability? I mean, you, you went through an incredible crucible to learn how to do it, but most of us never will. Right. No, you have to um, you have to sit, sit and think about it as um, a a problem of your own your own thinking, and what what you can do to actually change and even simplify the problem, um, no, no matter what it is you're sitting there facing. Um, I think what what helps people in just everyday business is this stoic idea that you can't you can't actually change you have only so much control over an outcome um, so you can't sit there thinking my life is going to be miserable if the outcome is like this um, but you can you can adjust exactly how you deal with the problem and and how you think about it 
You've talked about uh, gratitude. You've talked about forgiveness. Do you have a sense of gratitude towards the experience of being kidnapped and held hostage? That's a good question. A sense of gratitude to the actual experience. I, I came out feeling a sense of gratitude just to be alive. Um, and I, I still go back to that when I need to. So in other words, I have this incredible well of horrible experiences that I can draw on to, um, to feel that sense of gratitude again. Gratitude for the experience itself a good question um, <laughs> probably not yet it's, it's okay to say no <laughs> yeah uh I, kn I know that um solzhenitsyn after he he'd written quite a bit about his time in the gulag um expressed gratitude for his jailers and for the whole experience um, i'm not sure i'm there yet <laughs> do you want to be there uh maybe you know we'll we'll see we'll see what it requires <laughs> that's uh, a very honest answer <laughs> Uh, Mike, if if someone came to you tomorrow and said, you know, based on all of your experiences as a reporter, as a human, and certainly having been a hostage, uh, and they said, look, I want to learn how to perform better at everything I do as a human being, mm -hmm. what would your three most important pieces of advice be for them? Three of them. Well, the, fir the first thing would, would be to... Um, learn how to sort of live in the moment and deal with, with what's right in front of you. Um, because the, the, ne the next day is unpredictable and the, the previous day is gone. So, um, there, there's something about just dealing with the, the task in front of you. That's all important. Um, uh, something about that mental or reorientation that I said and, and of what Epictetus calls the, the only real freedom we have is very important because then you, you actually can adjust um, your own approach and your own thinking about about the problem in front of you. Um, a third thing, I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> Do you call yourself a Stoic? Uh, yeah, I, that, so I can call myself a Stoic without any anyone, um, you know, in sort of a, a Pope uh, role, um, arguing with me. I. I I've, I find a lot of wisdom by reading Stoics, yes. Um, but again, that's not the only, you know, the only discipline I look at. So, uh, Mike, it's, uh, it's been an honor uh, to, uh, to interview you and to hear about your experience. And thanks for, for sharing uh, all, the, all the details and, and the hard stuff. And it's, uh, it's remarkable uh, what, uh, what you learned from it. And uh, you're, you're carrying that with you. Thank you, Dave. Thanks for, thanks for, the, talk, for the discussion. If you liked today's interview, you really ought to read Michael Scott Moore's book. I got a radiofreemike.net. It's his website, and the title of his book is The Desert and the Sea. Yeah, there's a whole long title that goes after that. The Desert and the Sea, 977 Days Captive on the Somali Pirate Coast. <laughs> but if you remember The Desert and the Sea and Michael Scott Moore, you'll you'll find it. It's a, a profound read. Uh, and just having heard this interview, I think, you know, that, that there's more going on here than I had a tough experience. There's, there's a lot of introspection and, uh, things to learn about being a human being, uh, from Michael. So thanks again.